So in the introduction, you can read there, but the purpose of this class is to help you as a minister to break through any plateaus or barrier that may be holding you back or your church back from growing. My dream is by the time I'm 65, by the time I'm 70, that we see our kingdom at a million disciples. Come on. Yeah. Wouldn't sure, that be man. awesome? Yeah. I don't want to mess around with 100,000 disciples right. anymore. Yeah. I don't want to mess around with small growth anymore. I want our kingdom to be awesome. Oh, yeah. I want us to be a presence. I want us to be a force yeah. around the world, and we can do it. Amen. But we need to do it now. Yeah. We need to revive our churches. We need on, to take Rob. it to a level we've never been before. And so let's get right into it. Let's first, this first class, this first session here, we're going to be going in through 30-minute sections. We're talking just about you. If you do well, your church will do well. If you are doing great, your church will do great. And so we're going to talk about your church in the second session at, at 1.30, but let's talk about you. First of all, the leader's mission, vision, and goals. Let's take a look here. In Mark chapter 1 and verse 35, it says, Very early in the morning, while it was still dark, Jesus got up, left the house, and went off to a solitary place where he prayed. Simon and his companions went to look for him. And when he found him, they exclaimed, Everyone's looking for you. Jesus replied, Let us go somewhere else, to the nearby villages, so I can preach there also. That's why I've come. So he traveled throughout Galilee, preaching in their synagogues and driving out demons. Let's take a look at a related passage. Luke chapter 4, verse 20, uh, 42. At daybreak, Jesus went out to a solitary place. The people were looking for him. And when they came to him, to where he was, they tried to keep him from leaving them. But he said, I must proclaim the good news of the kingdom of God to the other towns also, because that is why I was sent. And he kept on preaching in the synagogues of Judea. Jesus' vision and mission directed his activity. Your faith and vision is the key to your church growing. The ability to say yes to God's will, to God's primary mission for your life while saying no to secondary callings is essential to effective leadership in the kingdom. Right. What we see here is, is Jesus is, is being approached. He, he'd been healing the night before. And they're coming up to him. They say, hey, we want you to do what we want you to do for us. And Jesus said, no. I'm doing my agenda. Even though those things are good to heal people, that's awesome. This is why I was sent. That is the type of leadership we need to carry into our churches. The kind that is non-reactive, self-directed, mission-focused. Where we can say no to the good and say yes to the best. And Jesus modeled that perfectly. But what's so awesome about Jesus is he discipled and passed it on to his disciples. How do we know that? Take a look in the, the next slide. Acts chapter 6 verse 1. In those days, when the number of disciples was increasing, the Hellenistic Jews among them complained against the Hebraic Jews because their widows were being overlooked in the daily distribution of food. So the twelve gathered all the disciples together and said, It would not be right for us to neglect the ministry of the Word of God in order to wait on tables. Brothers and sisters, choose seven men from among you who are known to be full of the Spirit and wisdom, We'll turn this responsibility over to them. And we'll give our attention to prayer and the ministry of the word. This proposal pleased the whole group. They chose Stephen, a man full of faith in the Holy Spirit. Also Philip, Prochorus, Nis uh, Nisanor, Timon, Parmenas, and Nicholas from Antioch, a convert to Judaism. They presented these men to the apostles who prayed and laid their hands on them. So the word of God spread. The number of disciples in Jerusalem increased rapidly, and a large number of priests became obedient to the faith. What did the disciples learn? They were imitating their master. When, when people are coming up and saying, hey, we got problems, we got issues, we got counseling problems, we got 
we got these women who need to be fed. And they said, you're right, it needs to be dealt with, but not by us. We have a higher calling. Our calling, our mission is prayer in the ministry of the word. And so we're not going to be entangled in that. In fact, we're going to delegate that to another brother. And we're going to focus on what God called us to. Does this have a pointer here, Ed? Uh, the middle, a very big one in the middle. Okay. Oh, great, perfect. It says, what do they focus on? Uh, our attention to prayer and ministry of the word right there. Look at that laser focus. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> a poet didn't even know it. Okay. Absolutely focused. And so we need to say yes to God's mission and say no to the shadow mission. There's God's mission for our lives, and then there's a shadow mission that we can get sucked into. It absorbs our time, our energy, but it can't feed our soul. It's not necessarily a bad or a sinful thing. It's just secondary. It's second best. And it may reward our ego. It may reward our wallet. But it distracts us from God's victory, his mission for our life. What is your shadow mission? What keeps you from having the focus that these men had here? Or even Jesus' focus? Maybe it's finding a second job. Maybe it's being the best in your fantasy sports league. Uh -oh. you know, maybe it's hobbies, distractions, day trading, wine tasting, <coughs> beer brewing. Maybe it's... <coughs> yes. <coughs> Any time-wasting, <laughs> fruitless activity will keep you from accomplishing your primary mission. Here's the thing, brothers. We've got some gifted people in here. And you will become great. Oh, just turn it off. Yeah, yeah. We hear you loud. Yeah. Turn it off. <laughs> Maybe I'll sneak up on it. There we go. There we go. Yeah. The fact is, you will become great at whatever you choose to focus on. Ooh, come on. But when we don't see the results in our ministry, mm -hmm. when we consistently don't see the kind of growth that we've been striving for, in our sinful nature, we will find something that will give us that sense of gratification. Wow, good point. We're going to find something that we can feel good at that, hey, this makes me feel good about who I am. And it may be something that's not necessarily bad, but we'll divert our energy into something that's going to give us that attaboy, that pat on the back. Because we're not getting it from our ministry. I want to challenge you to be careful not to trade your God-given calling and mission for a shadow mission. When you follow the shadow mission, in time you will become a paycheck preacher. What's a paycheck preacher? Just what it says. You are there, you get up, you do your job, you check in, you check out, but your heart's not into it. You've given up believing that it really matters or that it's going to make a difference. And so you get up there, you say, I'm doing this because it pays the bills. And I hope I can keep this up for a while longer. And they don't fire me. Listen, that is no way to lead a ministry. No one wants to be a paycheck preacher. Is that why he went into the ministry? Oh, I love the pay. That was it. I don't think so, brothers. What do we need to do about it? Number one, get open. Get open and bring that shadow mission out into the light of day and ask, is this really the highest and best use of my time? Now, listen, we can have hobbies. I got some hobbies. I like doing different stuff. But it's when that becomes a source of your confidence and your joy, your satisfaction, that's when it becomes a danger. Come on, brother. Good point. Pray and develop a passionate vision for your church. You need to have clear goals for your church and let people know what they are. 
Now, here are the goals that I set for the Tucson church, and you can follow along with me. This is all in detail here in your package. I set these goals. 250 at our first service on September 30th. Praise God, we had 483. That was gratifying. Yeah. Yeah. Our second goal, 100 disciples by 12, 31, 13. Now, if you notice, that is last year. We were not at 100 disciples. So, you know, I remember the words of Vince Lombardi. You know what he said? He said, when they asked him, they said, hey, how do you feel about losing that game? He said, I didn't lose the game. I just ran out of time. <laughs> you know, if you've got goals and you don't hit them, it's not that the goal is bad. You just ran out of time. <laughs> you just got to bump that back and keep going after that goal. <laughs> Our third goal, financially self-supporting by September 30th of this year. We're on track to do that. First mission team set off by September 30th. Okay, uh, Most mis ministry planters will tell you, if you don't plant a church within the third year of your mission planting, it probably will never happen. Wow. 100 enrolled disciples at the University of Arizona by September 30th. Okay, We want to have 100 disciples there in five years of the church planting. And then, uh, the thing I'm the most excited about, sending off our 10th mission team on the 10th anniversary of our church, September 30, 2022. Uh, these are the things that drive me. These are what get me excited about doing ministry, and I'm excited about hitting these goals. Come then on, what brother. I do is I've got my personal goals for this year. I've got a goal this year that our church grows to 120 disciples by the end of the year. On, I don't want to see small growth. I want to see electrifying growth. I want to see fast, exciting, powerful growth in the church. I've, I've got a personal goal to help 20 men either get baptized or restored. That I'm personally helping those people. It doesn't mean I meet them personally, but that I'm moving those studies through. And my wife also has that goal. And I'm excited about that. But do you have your goals? If you don't, you need to get them. You need to write them down, and what I'd recommend is write them down every day. I sit down right before my quiet time, after I've got my cup of coffee, I write down my 10 goals for the year, every day. Just write them out, and I just think about it, and I just, it just drives it deeper and deeper in there. Then talk about your vision for your church at your first midweek of every month. you got to talk about it, brothers. you got to let people know, guys, this is where we're going. They will recognize you as the leader when you set the direction for your church. Wow. They go, oh, that guy's taking us somewhere. <laughs> Every midweek at the beginning of the month, you just lay it out. Here's what we're all about. This is what we're ch our church is doing. Wow. Come on, brother. So, brothers, do you have a vision or are you falling prey to the shadow mission? Let's be leaders like Jesus and the apostles Amen. with the ability and the capacity to turn away from the lesser things to the greatest thing which is God's mission for our life. Let's talk about the leader's evangelism. Okay. In Luke chapter 4, verse 42, let's go back to this passage. It says at daybreak, Jesus went out to a solitary place. The people were looking for him, and when they came to where he was, they tried to keep him from leaving them, but... He said, I must proclaim the good news of the kingdom of God to the other towns also, because that is why I was sent. And he kept on preaching in the synagogues of Judea. Jesus had the clear vision. Yeah. Luke chapter 19, verse 10, we know what that says. So many times he said, hey, listen, the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. But what makes him unique is his ability to translate that vision into action. Come on. He didn't just tell him. He said, let's go. And they right. followed him. Right. His leadership style was non-reactive. He wasn't reacting to what other people were doing. And it was self-directed. He set his agenda. He didn't allow others to hijack his agenda, his time, or his mission. You must be able to translate your vision into action or you will be paralyzed in your ministry leadership. Action is king. It's what you do. I love this quote about Mark, uh, 
Mohandas Gandhi. It's from a biography I read. It said, some had spoken as well as he or better. But Gandhi's greatness lay in doing what others might do, but don't. Here's the encouraging thing, guys. You can be an effective and fruitful ministry leader. Everyone in here can do it. All you have to do is to do what other growing and effective church leaders are doing. If you do that, you'll start seeing the same results that they're getting. It's all about action. You're not just naturally cursed. <laughs> you don't just have a, 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 you know, a problem that keeps you from it. No. All you have to do is be able to translate what you want to see happen into action. That's what made Gandhi great. He had so little in, the, in terms of money, anything else. But his capacity to do things was awesome. Whether it's fasting, protesting, his fearlessness, he did stuff. There's so many distractions in the ministry. There's, there's things that, that keep us so busy with doing other things that are non-productive. But I want to ask you this. Did you get into the ministry to be a manager? Or to be an evangelist? When you became an evangelist, did they say, Hey, we are looking forward to you being an awesome manager of people. Did that just fire your bones up? You're like, yes! I'm looking forward to be a mid-level manager. Woo! All right. No, you wanted to be a man like Jesus, who just kept on preaching the word all the time. That's what you can become. That's what you can do. But it's all about what you do. Your schedule needs to be mission directed and mission focused, action oriented. In order for you to grow your church, the following must happen. Number one. Inviting people to church or bottle talk. Inviting has to happen, right? You know, okay, we're getting down to the, the basics here. Secondly, we need to follow up with people. Doesn't help just to invite them. We gotta actually call them back and say, please come and bring them. They need to come. And then when they're there at the evangelistic activity, whether it's church or Bible talk, we need to set up a study with them. Those three things inviting following up and setting up studies need to happen in increasing measure starting with you in order for your church to grow if your church is not growing i can tell you one thing these things are not happening in sufficient measure and so it begins with you you need to share your faith consistently now here's the dirty little secret Many times as ministers, we're hoping other people are going to share their faith. You bring the visitors, I'll preach to them. And we get frustrated with our people. Get out and share your faith. But the, the fact is we ourselves are not preaching the word. We're not inviting people to church. We pass by the retail clerk. We don't invite her. We see people on campus. We don't talk to them. On, That's man. just the flat out fact. Right. And then we get frustrated with our church and our people. We go, I don't know why my church isn't growing. Oh, and we ourselves are not doing the basics. We're not inviting people. Oh, wow. Come on. Here's some practicals. Number one, share your faith with a minimum of 100 people a month. Come on. 200 is better, but start with 100. <laughs> if you have a campus in your ministry, anywhere in the vicinity, walk on campus four to five times a week. You know, I go on campus, I just go, I can walk to the student union and walk back and share my faith with just a ton of kids. It's, it's not difficult, and it's not time consuming either. Follow up with people. Keep a stack of follow-up cards. Okay, these, I wish I had, I wanted to bring some. I forgot to, to buy some for everybody, but this is the best investment you can possibly make. Three by five cards, they're 99 cents down at your CVS drugstore. Put the name on the top and the phone number of the people you meet. Invite them to church. 
If they don't come after three times, throw that card away. Just toss it. Don't call them again. And then you, f you keep following up. But the ones who do come to church, you write that down. And you just keep track of the times you texted them, you, you called, and you make sure that these people, you're working with them, and you're setting up studies. This will help you. Don't just put, you know, sometimes we, we meet people, we type, them, type their name into our phone. But have you ever had this situation oh, where you no. look up someone's name and you go, who is that? <laughs> <laughs> you don't know who it is, and you can't find it because you can't remember their name. This solves that problem. It just keeps it clear, keeps it neat, keep a, keep a uh, thing right there. Don't put it in your phone. And finally, get into Bible study. Start with a goal of at least 20 people per month. Keep track and monitor these, these goals for uh, growth and improvement. Here's my evangelism log. This is how I keep track of this kind of stuff. This is for the month of February. This is last month. And so what we see here is this column is how many people I invited. This column is the guests. I have, I have this sheet in the back, and you can use this if you want to, so don't have to worry about it. Don't need to write this down. But these are the new guests that I bring to church, not people that have come a second time. And these are the Bible studies I held that day. This is the day of the month. So here on the first, I shared with five, and I had two studies. Uh, this day, here's no these two days, didn't share with anybody. This day I shared with 67 people, had a, couple, had a study here. Uh, this is a Saturday. Went out sharing with the church, shared with 50 people. This is, I keep track of what my running total is there. Here's the studies, I had four studies that day. And here's the name of the studies that I worked with. Um, and so I just keep track of that. You can see this last month I shared with 314 people. And then my studies, uh, 42 Bible studies last month. So I just keep track of it, and you can see here, look at this, look at this week. Zero, 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 zero. Uh-oh. I gotta get out and preach the word. So I get out there, you know, go out on campus, share with 18, or go out in the neighborhood and knock on doors. I just do a combination. But I go, brothers, let's go back to that previous script uh, this previous scripture. He kept on preaching. Yeah. That tells me a continual activity of his ministry. That's what we need to be doing. Yeah. Keeping on preaching the gospel. If your church is mired, it's up to you to get it growing. Yeah. If you've got a small church, you need to get, get it growing through your personal example. Now, listen, guys, some of us think, oh, you know, I don't know. Cold contact evangelism, I don't know if it really works or not. <laughs> You know, gosh, I, I just want to reach out to my country club friends or whatever. <laughs> Listen, I'll tell you what. I just decided when I went to Tucson, I am done with sissy little sharing. Come on, bro. I'm done with it. I've gone to Ashland. I, I planted a church there, and I, I go, praise God. But I evaluated that time, and I said, Rob, you could have shared your faith with so many more people. That church could have grown so much faster. More souls could have been saved. But you were scared. You were worried about your reputation. Because it was a small town. You're afraid about what people thought. But when I go to Tucson, things are going to be different. I don't care what people think. I'm going to preach the word. So I just started sharing. And praise God, I'm glad I made that decision. Here's some of the people who became Christians. <coughs> Okay, this, this, this is in the last 12 months. This last spring, this guy up here, Dustin, I met him. He became a Christian. He brought his mom out right here. She became a Christian. Now his sister is studying the Bible. She's through discipleship. She wants to become a Christian. This last summer, last week of finals, I went out sharing. I met this woman who was an Olympic bronze medalist from the University of Arizona. She brought her friend, she came to church and she brought her friends out. One of her friends was Brandon Beckin right here. Brandon is a student and a, a special ed teacher. Great brother. He got baptized right before 4th of July. This is Charles Wilson. I was out just sharing. I met this guy. He's an administrator. He's a young professional right here. And uh, he... Uh, 
he administrates student housing on campus. Great, great guy, great voice too. This is Amelia Quiroga. My wife and I were out door knocking. We passed out door hangers that I passed out here. Uh, she came to church and she said, hey, I wanted to go, I, want, I, I got this card. Here's my card. <laughs> you know, she brought it with her to church. <laughs> and it says it's like an admission ticket, exactly. And what do you know? It said Rob and Pam on the back. I don't remember meeting her. I, we may have just left it on her door, oh, but she came to church. Wow. Yeah. Became a Christian wow. at the end of the summer. Wow. Awesome. Uh, this guy right here, interesting story. He's a policeman in the Tucson Police Force. I was out sharing last December during finals week. I met this woman. She came to church. No, she didn't come to church. She told her boyfriend to go to church and check it out for her. <laughs> <laughs> So he came by himself. He liked it, and then he brought her a couple weeks later and brought their family. Now his girlfriend wants to get baptized, and we just did the church study with him on Friday. That's when this picture was taken. And so they're going to get baptized this month. This all happened within the last six months. Guys, if we ourselves, in many of our church situations, if we ourselves would commit ourselves to being like Jesus and just yeah. preaching the word, yeah. Yeah. it would energize you and it would totally transform the face of your entire ministry. Yeah. Those people are out there, they're open, they're waiting, but they need you to step up and just preach the word. Amen. Amen. Let's move on and talk about the leader's schedule. How's that, bro? Leader schedule. You need to control your morning schedule. You need to make the, your, your high value and most difficult activities, the priorities of the day, the day, they need to happen before 12 noon. Because if they don't happen then, they probably won't happen. What am I talking about? Evangelism, quiet times, uh, you know, just things that are, we tend to try to avoid. I read this book by Jim Collins, and I think it's called uh, Built for Greatness or something like that. It's his most recent book. In the book, he talks about the 20-mile march. He talks about how uh, there was an explorer that went to the South Pole, and he just tried to set his pace consistently, 15 to 20 miles every day. Another guy who was kind of a boy wonder, when it, when it got too windy out there, he would just camp in his tent, and then he'd have pushes of 50, 60 miles in a day. The guy who was consistent, steady, every day, in and out, reached the South Pole and came back, the other guy who would work in flurries ended up freezing to death and died in, South, uh, in the South uh, <coughs> Antarctica. There we go. Thank you. So we need to apply it in the sense of every single day we've got to be doing the basics of the ministry just like Jesus did. Get up at the same time six days Per week. This is a master skill. Let's face it, guys. A lot of times we'll have a late night appointment. We'll be up till 11:30 or 12:30 or whatever, and then we'll sleep in till 9:30. Or you know, we'll just be slogging around, and before we know it, it's 12 p.m. Whoa! I gotta get going here. And we're we're not disciplined. The key thing is get up at the same time six days a week. Just try it. <laughs> now, here's the thing I'd recommend. Get up at the same time and to help yourself say, I'll take a nap later on. That's better than saying, I'm going to sleep eight hours and then just I won't take a nap later. Right. It's better because you'll get up, you'll have your quiet time. You'll share your faith in the morning. You will feel like a lion in the strength of your life. Come on. You feel like I am the master of my fate. Wow. Read the Bible 20 to 30 minutes straight. One thing I'm doing this year is five chapters a day. That's good. I mean, I just enjoy doing that, and, it, and it's helping me to get deeper. I, I switch translation. That, that's handy. Read a good book 20 to 30 minutes a day. Read something spiritual, something in your field. I'm not talking about the latest, uh, you know, spy novel. 
<laughs> okay. I'm talking about something that's going to actually help you grow. Pray 30 minutes a day at least. I would recommend if you're married, make sure you pray with your wife three times a week. And we're going to talk more about that later. Exercise 30 to 45 minutes. Now you can double up on this. You can take a prayer walk and count that both as prayer there you go. and exercise. You feel like you're tight on time? Kill two birds with one stone. And share your faith 60 minutes a day. Not just, okay, I passed out an invite on my way to Walmart. I'm talking about dedicated evangelism time, like Paul did, preaching the gospel in the lecture hall of Tyrannus daily. That's the kind of ministry work we need to be doing. Listen, if you're an evangelist, shouldn't you be evangelizing? Yes. What are you getting paid for? What do you think people are paying you for? Come on. <laughs> Come on, brother. Come on, bro. All right, let's let, we'll finish this out and take a short break. Personal finance is 15 to 30 minutes a day. Guys, this is something I'm weak on and I have to just stay on top of. And so those weak areas, I know I need to focus on it more daily. Okay, so spend 15 minutes trying to stay on top of your finances. You don't get out of control. Here's a daily example. Wake up and be in your Bible by 7 and read a good book afterwards. Pray at 8. Exercise 8.30, 9.30, set up studies. This is key. If you get on the phone, you pull out your stack of cards, you just go through here and you call through and say, who can I meet with today? Call them up. That guarantees your day will be effective because you're in Bible studies. On, that is effective time. Yep. Come on, brother. But if you don't call, your afternoon will be misdirected. Yep. 10 o'clock, finances, administration, miscellaneous. Stuff that comes up, sudden shocks to the system, it's going to happen. But at 11 o'clock, evangelism power hour. You're going to get out, you're going to share your faith, you're going to talk to people, you're going to be in the community getting out of the house, out of your slippers, and out preaching the word. <laughs> Here's another practical in your schedule. Complete your midweek lesson on Tuesday afternoon. Aren't you tired of finishing it up at 6.45? <laughs> Don't you think people deserve a little more? <laughs> then scribbling it out as you go to, you know, honey, can you drive? I just want to... <laughs> <laughs> Complete your Sunday lesson on Thursday. Why is that? Well, one, you won't be stressed out on Saturday. Don't you hate that when you're, you're, you're in your Saturday appointments and you're, all you're thinking as you stare at those bros, what illustration am I going to use tomorrow? <laughs> you're distracted. But if you're done by Thursday, you feel free. You feel like, I am ready, baby. And then you'll get additional ideas going into the Sunday lesson that'll pop up and you can just write them in there and your weekend will be so much more effective. Get it done Thursday afternoon. Use Saturday for evangelism only. This is something I just stumbled on recently. I don't know why, but it's been awesome. Saturday is evangelism only. Let me go back here uh, to this log here. And what you'll see, take a look here on the Saturdays. On the 8th, this is a Saturday. How many studies? Four. Let's go here to the 15th. Four studies on this Saturday. How about the 22nd? Five studies. Wow. Man, I just, morning, 7 a.m. till night, I am studying the Bible with people, and at night I'll double date with a non-Christian or with a, a married couple. Use, don't, it's not time to go to Home Depot. <laughs> it is not time to fix your, your, your back fence. It is time to preach the word. Why? Because that's when people are free. They're off their work. And that's when you are working. So you are not free to go do something else. You can't go fly your kite. You need to be preaching the word on Saturday. And then use Sunday afternoons for Bible studies, leaders meeting. And then Sunday night we have a, a campus devotional. So your weekends are packed out. Let's take a break. Come on. Oh.